Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Three Principles Global Community webinar. The Three Principles Global Community, also known as 3PGC, is a nonprofit organization committed to bringing an understanding of the three principles to people throughout the world. I'm really happy that we were able to pull everything together for today's webinar. Um, about four or five months ago, Lynn had emailed and requested to do a webinar with Teresa, and there were several things we needed to put into place to make it happen, and it finally did this week. So I apologize for anybody who would have liked to be online and just recently saw the post or have, hasn't yet. It did go out late. Um, but we're here, and, and hopefully you'll be able to watch the video. So we have Lynn McWright and Teresa Walding with us. Um, they are both certified nurse coaches. They're three PGC practitioners and faculty at the Advanced Holistic Health School. Um, their interest lies in promoting the three principles in the healthcare industry. And rather than read the two bios here, I'll post them under the YouTube video on the recording. And I'm gonna turn it over to um, you, Lynn and Teresa. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much, Bonnie. We're delighted to be here. Um, well, I'm Lynn, Lynn Mack Wright, and I do have an advanced degree as a, a Master's of Public Health through the University of Minnesota. Beyond that, more recently, I've been able to be credentialed as a certified, nationally certified, board certified nurse coach, and that's through the American Holistic Nurses Certification Corporation. <laughs> So we are delighted to now have our own school which offers that certification. But beyond that, we actually have an 80 hour continuing education program for licensed health professionals, which leads to a certificate as a health coach. And on the way, the nurses can sit for the global certification as, as nurse coaches and as holistic nurses if they like. I'll start by saying that I met Sid in, in 1980 and was so um, open to what he had to share that I just, after the first five minutes, never looked back. And it allowed me the opportunity as a nurse to open my very first private practice of nursing in 1986 in California, which because it was 30 years ago was really unheard of at the time. But now because nurse coaching is becoming more commonplace, we're beginning to see it in lots of different practice areas. Teresa and I started working together um, in an organization called the American Holistic Nurses. We were the, the co-leaders of our local chapter and we've done um, regional conferences here, state, six state regional conferences. And we're actually planning a, a retreat in April which will, will be open to the public. But our, our background, of course, is nursing. And when I found an, an old tape that Sid Banks had done uh, on nursing, I thought it would be fun to share that with you today. He said that the, the thing about nursing is that there are two parts. And that the first part is the mechanical part, which we're all familiar with. But the other part, really, is the part about the feeling of wanting to help. And it's that feeling of wanting to help that Sydney Banks described as the most important thing in the world. So it's the feeling of wanting to help, which has apparently evaporated from some of our professional work, and which is part of the reason why um, there are so many challenges in the healthcare professions right now in addition to um, the economic and, and physical challenges. So we're absolutely thrilled to, to be bringing this to the healthcare professions today. We are only teaching the principles of the resilience paradigm. Um, Florence Nightingale had told us that nursing would change completely and she said that that would actually happen um, in, in the year 2020. So we're very closely approaching that now. And, and what we find is that the science of our profession has swung so far that it's almost um, 
hard to find the, the art of nursing now. So we need to bring that balance back. We found with the resilience paradigm, the three principles resilience paradigm, exactly what we need to introduce our feeling of wanting to help back into the, into the profession so that people can do their best work. The resilience paradigm really is a logic, which is irrefutable because it always has existed. And it has, um, a, it is a constant with no exceptions. It simply is the way that things work. So it's such a joy for us now to be able to work with a logic to present the principles with the understanding that they can only be realized through insight. So even though we teach through logic, the, the insight is the way that it works and, and the way that our students and their uh, clients un understand a greater um, feeling of connection and a greater feeling of our innate health, which we all share. I know that Sydney has some wonderful um, quotes for us, and one of which is that all feelings derive and come alive, whether negative or positive, from the power of thought. So that really is the basis that we're working from. And of course, he went on to say that thought is the missing link that gives us the power to recognize the illusory separation between the spiritual world and the world of form. So in holistic nursing, we talk about taking care of the patient as a whole, and we talk about taking care of the healthcare provider as a whole. And in their terminology, that whole is body, mind, and spirit. In the three principles, we really talk about mind, consciousness, and thought and thought being the, the area that we have the largest influence in our lives because that's where we experience our reality in the present moment. We can't experience the present moment in the past. We can't experience the present moment in the future. We can only experience the present moment now. So Teresa and I wanted to give some examples of insights that, that we have had and also some that some of our students have shared with us. So while I'm talking about the, the present moment of insight, I was thinking one of our 3P practitioners actually asked me if we'd had some success in working with older people in regard to the principles. And of course, since we're nurses, we have lots of older clients. And one of my nurse practitioners was working with a beautiful lady who is 85 years old and had tragically lost four family members in a three month period of time. She was so distracted in her grief that she was not able to remember to check her blood sugars. She wasn't able to remember to give her insulin and when she sat with Jan and Jan was able to explain to her that she could not be in two places at once, she literally had to focus on what she was doing today in order to take care of herself. Actually, her life depends on that. So this little old lady just got fire in her eyes and she said, do you mean to tell me that I am not able to take care of myself because I'm thinking about them? I can't bring them back, but I have the rest of my life to live. So she saw it right away. And of course, as we know in the principles, the proof is in the pudding. Three months later, she came back and she had had more blood sugar checks than she'd done in the previous three years. And she had a perfect A1C, which is the measure of uh, diabetic compliance. So we are seeing, well, I'll just call it nothing short of miracles um, on, on the part of our clients of all ages. 
And it's been so fun to be able to work with our, our students around working with their clients and, and the principals. I think I'll turn it over to Teresa now. Thanks, Lynn. Um, my name is Teresa Walding, and I'm a registered nurse. I currently work with Advancing Holistic Health in the continuing education program that Lynn and I started. I also work at my local hospital as a post-anesthesia recovery nurse, which wakes people up from surgery. So I have an opportunity to see people in, in a lot of different circumstances. I have also been um, recently taking care of my mother and sister who both had major surgery. And looking back at my life, and I'm, I'm now kind of separating it as pre-principles and principles understanding, I see a completely different person in myself than I had seen previously. I feel the ability to handle my situations or the things that are coming at me in a completely different way. You know, one, for example, one of the ways that, that came up to me that made me realize how, how far I had come was just before I flew home a couple of weeks ago, I had to get ready to, come, to leave my home state to go to Idaho and take care of my mom and sister. And the week before I left, my daughter got bit by a spider really, really bad. She has this huge scab in the middle of her forehead now. Thankfully, she's much better. So we made three ER visits the four days before I left. The one day I lost my debit card. The Monday before I left, my car broke. And in the midst of all of that, I'm still trying to figure out how I'm going to get to the airport. So for some reason, and, and I don't know what it is, but I knew that everything was going to be okay. And I realized that I wasn't stressing over all of these things that were happening. In a past life, or whatever you wanna call it, in my, in my past, I would have been having a lot of thinking about that. Why this, why now, how can, I need to go, do, you know, having all of this extra thought about it but i seem to be moving through this with an ease and a knowing that i was going to be fine that everything would take care of itself and i just can't did what came next and as a result i really left here with little or no stress and i thought there's something different about the experience of knowing where your feelings are coming from. And every time I see it, I see it a little bit different, but it's still as meaningful as the first time it happened. And I just, I think about the journey that we've been on, teaching the principals and beginning to record the videos for the school and finding our ground, finding out how we do this and Looking back at the videos from the very beginning to the end, I see that this wasn't just us doing this. This was something that was helping us, that was always true, that was grounding us because we didn't have to do anything by ourselves. It's pointing in the direction of how we experience life that we, that we don't have to justify or change or explain because people get it. They know when they hear truth, they can, they can feel it. And I have one friend and, and in particular, it's one of the first times that I shared this understanding where I could see the wheels turning in her, in her head of, oh, this is how it works. And it, it revolved around her fiance who she was like, you know, I just love the things he does to, for me. You know, he does the things that make me feel so good. And we started talking and I, we were talking about where that experience really comes from. And through many conversations and pointing in the direction and finally in one, the, the final conversation where she said, oh my gosh, I never knew. We were talking about a couple of things that he does for her that she just loves. And I said, well, is it him 
doing it or you experiencing it? And she said, well, yeah, he does this and he does this and I just love it. And I said, but whose experience is that? And all of a sudden she's like, it's mine. It's the way I'm thinking about it that's creating my experience. And I never knew that. And so she came back about three weeks later and she said, you know, since I got that, so many things in my life have changed. And I thought to myself, that's exactly it. That's how this works. It's the one insight where we understand where our experience is coming from, our thought in the moment that, that creates our life. And it's both personal and impersonal. It's, it's the things we don't tell anybody but still have high impact. It's the things we experience in our life that we experience more when we know where our experience comes from. I will be forever grateful for learning about the principles because there is, has never been a way of explaining it in my education that has had the impact that this has, which is why I wanna teach it. Back to Lynn. Back to Lynn. Well, I would love to say that um, in my experience, the, uh, the opportunity that we've had to uh, be coached is as valuable as coaching. Um, Bonnie, I'm just wondering, I don't have a circle around me. Is, am I actually on? Okay, great. One of the experiences that I had to be coached was quite an eye opener for me, just in the way of watching the understanding unfold. It, it happened over quite a period of time. And yet, even during the experience itself of being coached, of being in a coaching session, um, I could feel it. And it was just a little example about running late. And the, the coach was actually the one who was running late and I was going to be coached and I had no idea what I needed to talk about. So I thought, well, hey, that's kind of been an issue uh, in my life. So let me just do that. And as we talked, I could feel an actual shift in my chest and I knew that something had changed and yet I didn't know what it was. I thought that perhaps there had been a change in regard to my perception of time. But when I woke up the next morning, I was completely clear. I did not have a thought in my head. And in that moment, I was completely ready to get up and prepare for the day and what I realized was that I didn't hear the voices, the voices of self-criticism saying, oh no, you're going to be late uh, again. And the voices of, you're always late, you've done it again. Well, they weren't there. The self-criticism was absolutely gone. And in that open space, I was able to simply focus and prepare for my day and arrive in a timely manner uh, at my appointed hour. I, I actually thought at the time that I had seen something in regard to a man-made um, mechanism that we call time. And in fact, it, it was so much larger than that. I'm really grateful to Dr. Keith Blevins. Um, he pointed out to me that it was not time that I had seen, but thought. And that when that open space occurred and my thoughts were absent, that, that was a true understanding for me of the way that that thought works. And it was a wonderful, wonderful example, but it unraveled over 
weeks of time, if not months, because I thought I had seen just a tiny fraction of what it was. And yet later on, I saw that, that in fact, that was entirely true, that it was the aspect of thought itself, which had been revealed to me. So when, when we teach about thought, it's because it's the one thing that we have um, at our disposal to, to be able to work with. The, the concept of mind and the concept of consciousness are so large. And yet, of course, anytime we talk about one of them, we are talking about all three because the three truly are one. The only reason we even break them apart as separate um, and give them names is to be able to talk about them. So when, when we're talking with our clients in regard to thought, we, don't, we do call it the resilience paradigm, but we don't have specific words that we use um, in our conversations with our clients. What, what we actually do, um, which is the same learning process that we use with our students, is insight. So the goal of all coaching is insight. We want our um, patients, our clients, to be able to see for themselves that they might want to make some change or to see some larger picture of Usually they are coming to us in regard to issues around um, relationships, around business, around uh, transitions, like, shall I go back to school? Th those kinds of things. And, and of course, as nurses, we do also see a lot of people around issues of health. So as we're, as we're pointing to the way that that thought works, we may call, we may use terminology such as separate realities to help them see that no two people in the world can see things exactly the same way. And that's been such a revolution, re realization for so many people, which is the re revolution. But for, for us to know that we no longer need to spend any time trying to convince people to see things our way, because we simply can understand that they will see things their way and that no two people can think alike. So that's a huge weight off of our shoulders and through no doing of our own, it simply drops away. A misconception is gone, leaving us much more free to um, engage in the present moment. When we are not anxious about the future, when we are not ruminating about the past, we have the entire moment to enjoy and learn from. And we don't hold a judgment about that experience in the moment. We don't call it good or bad. If, if our mood level is, is one thing today and a different thing tomorrow, what we understand is that it is all part of the human experience. And all of human experience is to be embraced. That's our purpose here on the planet. So we, we don't um, call it positive or negative. We simply appreciate the moment for what it is and have the understanding that it will change. Well, what we're finding and teaching is that it's now possible for us to, to, to realize that thought and feeling are simply two sides of the same coin, that we can't have a feeling without a thought, that the thought actually comes first and then the feeling. But if we have a feeling, which seems to be in this example heavy, for example, uh, we can know that there's a thought that goes along with that, but we don't have to identify what it is. We can simply uh, choose to let that thought go, let it float through and another thought will appear. Uh, we are not in a position as human beings to control thought. That, that simply can't be done more than a couple minutes at a time. And what we now 
are seen is a much larger appreciation of the full range of, of human experience and how mind, thought, and consciousness come into play in every moment of our lives through thought because we are actually experiencing our reality or creating our reality, our actual reality through, through thought. And it's not our, our personal little individual thought, but rather the much larger panoply of thought that is, is in the consciousness of all of us and that it's constantly changing. Teresa? Yeah, so many thoughts <laughs> were going through my mind as you were talking. And, and mostly in regard to my own journey in the last two, two and a half years, whatever it's been. Mm -hmm. And I really was remembering the very first time that this came absolutely clear to me that I was creating my own reality. You know, we had been teaching it for a while. We'd been recording videos, um, had many conversations and it, and it's kind of elusive at first you're like, yeah, I get it. Yeah, I get it. And I was intellectualizing it, but I didn't get it. And then one day I was at work and, and we have a person at work who, um, you know, people that come to into the room and sort of forcefully try to talk to you or are angry or whatever that thing is. And you just kind of cringe back and want to hide. Um, that was happening very frequently where I work. And I realized how much judgment I was having about how that person came and how I was feeling about how she was coming across. And I was sitting there and I was having all of this thought about it. And I realized I was having like heavy breathing and feelings of wanting to leave and all of that kind of thing. And suddenly the room got very quiet and all I was left with was my own thought. And I realized I was creating all of that and putting it onto her behavior. The reality was that was my experience. And culturally for her, that was very normal. It was just always very hard for me to um, be accepting of it. And suddenly I went, oh my gosh, I have created this my whole time I've known her for 20 years. Not all of the time, because of course, not all of the time she, she came across that way. And so much of my thinking about the situation fell away and I saw a completely different person standing in front of me who when I could finally hear again, I'm, I, it felt like a really long time, but I think it was a matter of a few seconds that I heard something different. I heard a request and not a confrontation. And I suddenly relaxed. Now that doesn't sound very big, but when you're the one experiencing this, it was huge. It had implications or for, for many, many areas of my life not just that it was the fact that i saw how i was creating my experience that helped me to see many other areas of my life where i was doing the same thing so as i caught that glimpse of it it was highly impactful i lived in that feeling of knowing for days and it helped me it helped me to understand why other people acted the way they did. It helped me be less judgmental of what they were doing or saying because they were living their own thoughts and feelings. And when I saw someone struggling, where before I would think maybe, I wish they would just stop that, I was inclined to help them or to offer some assistance that maybe would ease their burden of whatever was happening. I also noticed I found deeper meaning to my work. I began seeing my patients completely different than I had before. And when people woke up from anesthesia, 
for like two weeks, I would have people wake up and touch my face. And I thought, what is, what is this? It was something different and I knew it was different and it was wonderful. It was a connection and it has never left. Realizing where your experience comes from has so many mean, so much meaning to so many areas of your life. You know, I, I've been incessantly talking with my family about what, what we're doing. And I used to try to, oh yeah, it, it's like this, it's like that. I don't have to do that. I can now just say, well, you know, we all get exactly what we're thinking about. It's ours. Embrace it. And know that it's real. It's not something out there. It's something in here. And my sister, who I've been talking to forever now, called me two nights ago and she goes, you know, I think I get what you're talking about. And there was a calm, a calmness in her that I have not seen in my whole life. Now, I don't know what her whole experience of is, it, of, is of what happened, but I do know that I'm talking to a different person. Those are the things that change in our life when we have our insight, and we can have many a day, it doesn't have to be just one, that help us, they help us live a better life. Knowing that it's just thought and it comes and goes and we don't have to give it life if we don't want to, there's power in that. The ability to see that helps us live a better life. That's what I'm enjoying about learning and experiencing how the principles work. And I am grateful for this community of like-minded people that are wanting to bring this to everyone they know. Lynn, back to you. Oh, wow, Teresa, thank you so much. How beautiful. Yeah, I'm, I'm really reflecting on um, what Teresa and I have embraced as our professional responsibilities. And in the resilience paradigm, it's been such a joy to find that we are seeing what we describe as flat earth thinking. Remember the, in the old days when um, human beings used to be afraid that they could sail off the edge of the world and they would carry really big anchors with them on, on their sailing ships? Well, we're in an era now where we've got a lot of flat earth thinking about healthcare and, and about life in general that is going to change very, very um, dramatically. And I know that just as short a time ago as 150 years, we had no knowledge of what we now call germs. So it, it's so odd to think that we lived, human beings lived in a world without germs. Well, of course that's not possible. They were always there but it, they hadn't been seen under the microscope. And in fact, the physician that identified that such a thing existed and gave it its name wasn't able to prove it because the microscope had not been invented yet and would not be invented for another 40 years. So even though Dr. Semmelweis was, was able to um, work in the delivery room of the hospital where he worked um, and they had a huge epidemic of, of fatalities among the, the new mothers and the incidence of uh, death was somewhere around 16%, 20%. And so it was a very uh, terrifying era for a woman to, to give birth in the hospital. Emma Weiss um, had a very deep insight when one of his colleagues died. He, he realized that he had died of all of the same kinds of symptoms that the mothers in the maternity ward had died from. And that 
there must be something on the scalpel which was being carried from the morgue where they were examining the bodies into the delivery room. So he stood at the doorway of the delivery room and insisted that the physicians um, change their aprons and the maids wash the aprons. Um, he insisted that the nurses wash their scalpels so they they had to have new scalpels or their old one washed and then find which one theirs was again and then the third thing was that the physicians had to wash their hands and that was the last straw they did not want to wash their hands they said look at my hands they're clean there's nothing on them why should i and of course, if there was some, you know, dirt or blood, they probably would. But if it appeared to be clean, they they didn't get the idea. And and so even though the mortality rate decreased from some sixteen or twenty to three three percent, it it still was a continuing problem. And it wasn't until Louis Pasteur that the um, germ was identified for what it was. But by that time, Semmelweis, the physician who had identified it, was gone. It, it's, it is that way today. We're really standing at the edge of chaos in regard to the healthcare system. And what we see is that the resilience paradigm really is the 100% solution to the problems that, that plague us today. Right now, um, as a public health person, I see areas where there are people being treated for cardiac problems, people being treated for diabetes, people being treated for smoking cessation, programs for um, child abuse, and, and what, how incredible it is for us to be able to see that all of this has an underlying misunderstanding which is an understanding of where the experience of, of life comes from. And through the three principles now, we can explain that it is a constant. It is never um, changing. It has always existed, and it's available to all of us. This is truly the democratic way that we have all heard about and not seen because it levels the playing field to know each of us creates our own reality. And through that understanding of thought, each of us now has the opportunity to have a more loving life, a more compassionate life, a more, um, I, I wanna say sharing life. In other words, that they're not keeping to themselves, but. They're, they're enhancing their entire family and their entire community. And not to say that we won't have trials because of course that's part of the human condition. And this is a contact sport and we will have tissue damage, but we will also heal. And knowing that is a solace to us through the times that appear to be more difficult. And when we, have the capability now not to judge ourselves or others what a relief i mean so much of what we've done in in our culture today is is based on evaluating and assessing and critiquing and is simply no longer no longer is required so what freedom that that brings to us and just as the old understanding of um, falling off the edge of the earth has, has gone by the wayside and that flat earth thinking has disappeared, so it will be um, and is now beginning to be with, with the resilience paradigm that, that people have a much larger understanding of the whole and of their own functioning in that whole. Teresa? Yeah, I, I'm thinking about the um, changes that I'm seeing with my patients or just the conversations that I have. Uh, one particular person comes to mind who had a total knee replacement 
and a very stoic, very, very nice man. And we ended up having to wait a couple of hours for a bed at the end of the day. So it was just him and I, and so I invited his wife in to sit with us while we were waiting. And we began having a conversation about his total knee and you know how much better he was gonna feel and all of that. And he got very tearful. And so we kind of explored what, hap what was happening with that. And he said, I've had all of this planning about getting the surgery that I didn't give any thought to what I was going to do after my surgery. And he said, and now that it's here, I'm afraid to walk on it. I don't know what to do right now. And so I was able to share with him in a very meaningful way that it was really his thought about it that was creating this fear. And so we talked about it a little more and a little more and all of a sudden the, his wife started crying. She goes, I had no idea there was going to be so much emotion around being able to walk again. And so we talked about that as being thought in the moment. And talking about how it's okay to feel our thought in the moment. If we're thinking it, we're feeling it, who are we to judge what we're feeling? Just acknowledging that that's how it is gives us a sense of peace or gives me a sense of peace. I hope it does other people. But to not be afraid of our experience is a whole nother thing. And so we had two hours to talk about this and he was game playing and talking about he was gonna be able to do this and going to be able to do that. And when it came time to go up to the room, he said, I really need a hug. And I said, okay. So he gave me a hug. He said, thank you. I think I'm more prepared now than I was ever, even before surgery. And his wife was crying and we went up to the room and they both thanked me. And I left with a feeling of gratitude, of making a connection, of loving them through this very different kind of life for them. None of us wants to get old and when we have all of these things that are happening to our bodies and we have all this thinking about it, we sometimes forget that all of that's just thought too. And I wish I knew how that ended, but I did know that there was some impact of some kind that I think was beneficial. If, none, no, if to no one else, it was to me to open up to have those conversations with anybody who's listening. And I find that it, the more I share, the more that it comes up in very personal ways with whether it's my family or my patients, or sometimes when I have little talks with myself, it is impactful and it is important. And it is part of being human that we can love each other through anything. But with this understanding, all bets are off because we don't have to blame anyone else or something else or a circumstance or our own self-criticism for what's happening. It's in the recognition of how it's happening that big chunks of things just fall away. It's not, there's no reason to go there. There's no reason to second guess it. If we're thinking it, we're feeling it. That is the only way we create experience. And sometimes we see it and sometimes we don't, and that's okay too. We, well, th yes, Teresa, thank you. Thank you so much. We really um, have a joy in answering questions too. So if you want to type into the chat box, we might have some time to reflect on those at, at the end here. One of our students is on faculty at the um, university teaching nursing and her required uh, curriculum is cognitive behavior therapy. So she has already an understanding of the resilience paradigm herself and was so brave 
to take the piece of paper and draw a line down the middle and let her students know that on one side of the page was cognitive behavior therapy as taught by the um, institution and that the on the other side of the page was how it really works. And she found something really remarkable in that none of her students picked up their cell phones during the entire semester. They wanted to hear every word that she had to say. It's, it's quite common now that students are on their, on their devices uh, the whole time that they're in class, but they didn't, they didn't pick up their devices. They wanted to hear how it really works. So even without um, taking this into the schools ourselves, our, our students are beginning to introduce it. And it's, it's such perfect timing because of the burnout that is being experienced in, in the helping professions. Recently, a study was done in Texas of graduates of the schools in the last five years. And what they found was that the average length of stay in the profession for nurses was only 18 months. But they would actually leave the profession entirely before they had their first renewal period for their license. So that, that's just one indicator of the importance of what we're doing today. Uh, another is that the average length of patient stay in the hospital is only 4.5 hours. When I was a student, patients stayed for five to seven days. So what we're finding is that hospitals are closing all across rural America and that a time will come when nursing will be moving back into the community and that the institution won't be entirely um, the place that the public looks for nursing. As we begin nurse coaching and health coaching, we, we have a wonderful Gallup poll. And the Gallup poll has shown for every year in the last 16, 17 years that nurses are considered both the most ethical and the most honest of helping professionals. So we have the trust of the public and the, the timing is so right for us to begin bringing the resilience paradigm to people um, in today's world where they can truly use what we know to be the innate health that we all share. Back to Teresa or? There is a question in the chat box. Do you want me to read it? Yes. Okay. It says, I'm curious how you use the principles in support of the patient's innate physical health. Teresa? Yeah, I, um, sure. I, I think, um, like in the example I was giving of the gentleman with the total knee and his, his experience of, of the fear and that kind of thing, he verbalized to me his feelings about, you know, deteriorating health or not being able to walk and now getting the new knee and what that would mean to him. We also talked about, you know, being resilient. We're already resilient. Sometimes we just don't see it. So when I talk with patients about, you know, getting through a diagnosis, or we've had a couple of nurses who have been going through um, cancer themselves, breast cancer in particular, talking about where that experience is coming from, the cancer doesn't define us. The procedure doesn't define us. That's just what's showing up. We can look at that and know where our experience is coming from. And when we talk about it in that way, a lot of people will have their own insight. I don't know what someone will think or feel about their diagnosis or the circumstance that has shown up or a, a loved one that is very ill. But we all have our own innate health. And I have seen people who have had a very minor procedure, which most of us wouldn't even blink at, who blow it completely out of proportion, wake up in panic attacks, and become angry with the staff. And, you know, anyone who's worked in, in healthcare or even been at the grocery store can see some people can make 
a mountain out of a molehill and other people who are very, very close to dying and be so loving and kind and say things to you like, when you ask them, how are you doing today? They'll say, well, I woke up today, today's a good day. And I'm going to be as happy as I can be until I'm not here. The, the trick is to not judge them for their feelings. Those are their feelings. We have no business getting into their, their feelings or telling them how to show up that day or how to experience their thought in the moment. All we can do is point in the direction of how it's created. People get that. It, you would think they wouldn't, but some people get it almost instantaneously. It just took me a little bit longer to understand it. <laughs> and, and that's okay too, there's no timeline. But sometimes you can even talk someone through a panic attack. I did it a couple of weeks ago. She woke up in a panic attack and couldn't gain control of her breathing or the feeling and just kept saying, you know, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Well, all of the monitors say you're breathing fine. That doesn't make the feeling go away. So we started talking about what she was thinking about. Well, it turns out she had a mother who died after a surgery, quote, from the anesthesia, and she was afraid she was going to die. That's a whole different feeling than just waking up with a panic attack and, and people assuming they know why she's having it. So we support our patients in their own innate health by pointing in the direction of where the experience comes from. They make up the rest of it themselves. But most of us want to have the best life that we can. We want to have the best experiences that we can. But when the other ones show up, that you don't have to avoid them. Feeling them is, is part of being human. We do have the ability to put extra emphasis on a certain feeling and really embrace it and really feel it or we can have the ability to go, oh, that's what I'm feeling. Okay. And we hold it lightly and don't, it doesn't mean as much. But those are the ways that we show up every day. So I think if that answers your question, is supporting our patients in their innate health is recognizing where that experience comes from. They make the meaning themselves, ourselves, each of us individually. It also alleviates me of the responsibility of trying to do something for someone, which never works, by the way. I've tried that, you know. So in my world and in my experience, there is no other way to help people. Lynn, any thoughts? Well, I'm just remembering at one time when I was scheduled to have surgery and there was a lot of fear around that. Nurses know too much. And I, I remember Sid talking to us about having to look at our feelings without judging. And so um, one day I had the opportunity to do that around fear. And as, as I looked directly into that fear, it, it's just, I just sat with it. I, I didn't um, judge it. But for me, what it seemed like at the time was that, that the fear simply evaporated. I probably would use different words today. Um, it, what I would probably say today is that I realized that fear truly did not exist, that it was totally made up. But at any rate, I, I had that understanding and, and I had a little tape that someone had been had made for me prior to surgery about going to a safe place. And um, I kissed that little tape goodbye because I knew that there was nothing to fear. That we are completely taken care of and that the resilient paradigm is behind all of that. And as we are gathering ourselves personally and professionally in sharing the resilience of the three principles. It's just a joy to be bringing this to
to the world today. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Lynn and Teresa. I know you have a hard stop coming up in two minutes, so um, it's, it's been a very insightful discussion. Thanks. And I just want everyone to know that the next scheduled webinar is January 10th with Dickon Bettinger. Um, and just watch to see if another one pops up unexpectedly, but the next scheduled one is January 10th. Um, I also will, um, underneath the video, I will make sure to post Lynn and Teresa's information, and if you want to get in touch with them, um, you'll be able to act to get in touch, I think, through the website for Advancing Holistic Health. Is that right? AdvancingHolisticHealth.com. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, well, thanks, everybody. See you next time. Oh, thank, thank you. you so much for joining us today. Happy holidays, everybody.